Hey there, it's Professor S, and for the next five minutes, I want to help you get to a place of understanding with the very challenging concept of secondary active transport. Now, I'm going to be doing this lesson with the assumption that you have already seen my five minute lesson on the secondary active transport analogy. That will help you conceptualize what happens in the actual process, which is what I'm going to be going through in this video. Now, secondary active transport begins with pumping. So if we look to my right, we have right down here an integral membrane protein, and specifically this is the sodium potassium exchange pump, which I've covered thoroughly in another video. But just as a refresher, this pump uses energy from ATP to pump sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell at a ratio of three sodium out to two potassium in. And that's what it does. Now there's a number of reasons this pump is used in different cells, but what I want to focus on here is the effect that this pump has on sodium ion concentrations inside the cell. Because we're using ATP to pump sodium out, that keeps sodium ion concentrations inside the cell low. And what that means is that if sodium has a way to passively follow its gradient into the cell, it will. And keep in mind, if sodium is flowing down its gradient, there's kinetic energy associated with that flow. And that kinetic energy could be harvest, harvested to accomplish other things. Now over here, we have a different integral membrane protein. This is what's called a symport. And specifically in this video, I'm using a sodium glucose symport. This molecule binds to sodium and allows sodium to translocate through the membrane from high to low concentration. Since that pump over there is keeping sodium concentration in the cell low, this protein is going to bind to sodium and allow it to enter the cell following its gradient. But there's a catch. When this model molecule binds with sodium, when this protein binds with sodium, a binding site on it for glucose develops a very high affinity for glucose. Sodium cannot move through this protein unless it brings glucose with it. That's why it's a symport. The two molecules flow in the same direction. And so when sodium binds on the outside of the cell, which it will because of its high concentration outside relative to inside, that will create a strong attraction for glucose, which will also bind. And when both of, those uh, both of those molecules bind to this protein, it will translocate them into the cell. Now glucose is being moved against its gradient. It is flowing from low to high glucose concentration. But it's being pulled by the energy within the sodium concentration gradient. So the sodium potassium pump creates a concentration gradient. The symport allows sodium to follow that gradient and harnesses the energy to pull glucose into the cell against its gradient. That's active transport of glucose. It's powered by the ATP at the sodium potassium exchange pump. We spend ATP at one location to lead to active transport at a second location, hence secondary active transport. There's another way this process can work though. If you noticed, I just changed this protein. It's no longer a sodium glucose symport. It's now a sodium hydrogen ion antiport. It now is going to do exactly what the symport did, but with the catch that instead of sodium and glucose binding on the same side of the membrane, the binding site for the proton, the hydrogen ion, is on the opposite side of the membrane. Again, this molecule will only let sodium go through when protons are binding on the interior and flowing out of the cell through the same transporter. The protons are flowing against their gradient. They're going from low to high concentration. So it's an active transport process because sodium's flowing in one way and the protons are flowing in the opposite direction. We call it an antiport. It is still an example of secondary active transport and Again, the real takeaway here with secondary active transport is to remember, you use a pump protein to create a gradient and you use energy of that gradient to drive other active transport processes. So I know we just passed four and a half minutes. 
I'm not quite going to get this one in completely under five, but I'm going to get as close as I can. Many students who struggle with secondary active transport struggle not so much because the process is challenging, which it is, you've got to think it through, but it also seems confusing. Many students respond to it with, why does this even exist? Why not have a separate uh, ATP powered transporter for everything we want to move? And the reality is there are many situations in cells where a single cell has to transport many different things simultaneously. And it's far more energy efficient to have a single motor driving everything. Think kidney function for a second. You have cells in your kidneys that it's their job to get the nutrients from the urine back to the blood and waste from the blood to the urine. That's a lot of substances moving opposite directions actively. If you only have to power one pump with ATP, the sodium potassium exchange pump, and then you can link it to a bunch of symports and antiports, you can power a whole bunch of things with one engine. And that's far more efficient than having a single specialty engine for every single transport process. So keep in mind, there are ideas like that in the background that don't always emerge right away when you're learning concepts like secondary active transport. Seek them out. Ask your instructors for clarity when you don't see uh, that clarity because there's always something out there that can help you understand it. And I hope this got you there. Gone fishing? He doesn't even own a fishing rod or a boat. This is ridiculous. He doesn't, never uses a script. He expects me to do everything. He's so hard to work with. If you enjoyed that video, here are a few others you might enjoy. Like and subscribe to keep me employed, please.